Uh, this is a lecture on immobilisation and storage of nuclear waste that's uh, been prepared for the Nuclear Institute Ref Guide uh, to the Nuclear Industry. Uh, it just gives a brief run through to, through some of the technologies that are used to immobilise radioactive waste and that are used to dispose of it eventually. So if we look at radioactive waste generation, there are three main sources. There are military programmes, there's the radioactive waste uh, associated with the use in hospitals and research laboratories of radioisotope sources, and of course there's the nuclear energy industry. And this talk is going to concentrate on the waste generated uh, throughout the nuclear energy fuel cycle. So we've got the mining and milling of uranium ores, there's the reprocessing of fuel discharge from reactors, and the decommissioning of the facilities after the end of life of the facility. So why do we bother with radioactive, uh, why do we bother with nuclear energy if it's going to develop radioactive waste? Well, the reason for that is that the uranium nucleus can give us a massive source of energy. If we compare uranium to coal, for example, in an AGR reactor, which is an advanced gas cool reactor, one tonne of uranium is equivalent to 20,000 tonnes of coal. Using a different technology, a fast reactor, where we can actually breed some fuel, uh, one tonne is equivalent to two million tonnes of coal. So this is why nuclear energy is such a big part of the energy mix in the UK and throughout the world. If we're looking at the full fuel cycle and we're looking at the carbon contribution of our energy sources uh, to our kind of carbon footprint of uh, each individual country, then nuclear energy can help reduce that carbon footprint through other ways as well. If we're looking at the transport of fuel, for example, a typical nuclear power station requires about 40 tonnes of fuel per year. And that's about one lorry load per fortnight over the whole year. If we compare that to an equivalent um, coal-powered fire station, it requires 3 million tonnes of coal per year. And that's the equivalent of two train loads per day. So you can start to see how nuclear energy can reduce the carbon footprint of the UK electricity production and also worldwide. And nuclear energy is indeed a worldwide industry, as this map shows. This map shows two lots of information. Uh, the colours of each country indicates the percentage of electricity derived from nuclear energy. So you can see, for example, here, uh, France in the red colour has over 70% of its electricity derived from nuclear energy. Uh, the UK in green is about 15% currently in 2011 of the electricity derived from nuclear energy. And you can see other countries around the world, USA, Canada, Brazil, China, and China's got a very big uh, programme of developing nuclear energy, and lots of other countries throughout Europe all have nuclear as part of their energy mix. The other information on this uh, map shows parts of the nuclear fuel cycle. And this is indicated by these symbols here. So we start with uranium mining. And you can see Australia only has uranium mining. They have no uh, commercial el electricity production from nuclear. And then other parts of the nuclear fuel cycle, conversion, enrichment, fuel fabrication, reprocessing, and finally vitrification. And you'll notice that the UK here, we have all aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle apart from uranium mining. And we source a lot of our uranium mining, not from, only from Australia, but from Canada as well. But other countries such as Kazakhstan and the US also have uranium mines. So it is a truly worldwide nuclear industry. If we look at the UK situation, this map shows the UK radway sources. And these uh, yellow squares indicate the nuclear power reactors. We've got Hartlepool here, which is an AGR. Uh, Chapel Cross, Hunterston, Torness, uh, up to Doonray where they had the fast breeding reactor in the south, Sizewell where we've got the only PWR in the UK, and other reactors such as the eight, uh, Magnox at Oldbury, the Magnox at Berkeley, Hinkley Point. And some of these sites have been selected again for uh, new build possibilities in the UK. There are, of course, other sources of radioactive waste uh, in the UK. As I mentioned at the start, you can see medical and industrial sources and defence sources as well. So if you now look at a map showing the rad waste volumes in the UK, we can see by far the most radioactive source by volume is located in West Cumbria at the Sellafield site. But there is intermediate and low-level waste, which are the least radioactive types of radioactive material, located at many of the um, nuclear electricity production sites and uh, nuclear power plants around the country. And you'll see here Dune Ray on the north coast has a significant amount of waste as well. So looking at the nuclear fuel cycle in more detail, uh, we mine uranium as an ore, and then to 
use it in a nuclear fuel reactor, we have to enrich the percentage of uranium-235 from 0.7%, which is the natural occurring um, ore, to about 4 5% to work in a light water pressurised system. So to convert the 235 content up to that percentage, we have to kind of go through a process of conversion and enrichment. And we convert the uranium into a gas, and that allows us to enrich it. And then after the enriched uranium, we can then fabricate the fuel, which in the UK happens at the Springsfield site near Preston. And then we can put it into an electrical power reactor. Now, once the fuel has been used up in that reactor, we can transport it then to a choice of one or two um, ways forward. We can either go for a reprocessing system like we have in the UK and France, for example, where we try to uh, remove the useful uranium and the useful plutonium, and we can put that back into this nuclear fuel cycle. So the plutonium can be used in a mixed oxide fuel, or we can recycle the uranium and put it back into the conversion process to generate the higher content of uranium-235 again. Or the other option is to not use what's called a closed fuel cycle and to use an open fuel cycle where there is no reprocessing and the waste is just taken for uh, waste management and disposal. And that's a system currently uh, undertaken in countries like the United States. So if we're looking at the content of a nuclear reactor, this is where a lot of waste will be generated. And the nuclear reactor has several uh, different parts that make up the core. So we have fuel, which was originally uranium metal, but now has many variations and is typically uh, uranium dioxide these days. And for a 1,000 megawatt reactor, uh, we typically use about 75 tonnes a year for that. Moderators are used to slow down the neutrons, which kind of uh, increases the chance of the uranium fissioning. And in the UK, historically, we've used carbon in the form of graphite for our Magnox and our AGR reactors. But more commonly around the world, uh, light water is used as moderator because light water is a very good uh, moderator for neutrons. In Canada, they use a heavy water system, D2O, and they can use a heavy water system with a natural uranium fuel rather than an enriched fuel. We have cladding, which is uh, a material that contains the fuel and prevents the release of the radioactive fission products. And we must have a coolant to take the heat source out of the reactor. Uh, again, with the Magnox and the AGR reactors, we use gas. But with the pressurised water system, water is again used under pressure, circulating through the core to remove the heat. To help us control the reaction, we can uh, insert or remove control rods. And these are usually made out of boron or cadmium. And this symbol here means that they have a high capture cross-section for neutrons. So this means they can take neutrons out of the flux and reduce the reactivity of the core. And of course, all this is contained in a shield, which is usually steel and concrete, and this is used for radiation protection and sometimes as a pressure vessel as well. So this picture here shows an example of a Magnox fuel assembly used in the first generation of nuclear reactors in the UK. Uh, this is one fuel rod per assembly. It has Magnox cladding, which is magnesium, no oxidation, and a uranium metal fuel. So you can see the metallic fuel pellets in the centre of the uh, fuel rod here. A newer type of fuel assembly uh, is the PWR, pressurised water reactor fuel assembly. And this is typically about 264 fuel rods per assembly, uses a zircaloid cladding, and in this case uses the uranium dioxide fuel. Now, other types of fuel rods are used in the UK, and this is an AGR, or advanced gas, uh, fuel, gas cooled reactor fuel. And here I have a spacer and an empty fuel rod from an AGR uh, reactor. So you can see here, this would be used to hold the uh, dioxide fuel, and then the fuel rod is placed in the spacer, and you can see how those fuel rods will be kind of kept separated by this ring. There are other developments in fuel. Uh, this is a pebble bed fuel, which is um, being put forward as one type of fuel. And in this example here, you can see that there's a very small fuel kernel of uranium dioxide, about half a millimeter, which is then surrounded by silicon carbide and an inner pyrolytic carbon coating. And this is used as the uh, moderator around the fuel. And these particles with this coating tend to be just under a millimeter in diameter. And many hundreds of those are then uh, put into a larger ball with a sphere uh, with a, di a diameter of about 60 millimeters. And this is a once fuel through fuel cycle fuel. So this helps with anti-proliferation because it's very difficult to remove the kernel of uranium fuel 
from this uh, ball type fuel. So once the fuel has been through the reactor, it's very radioactive and it's also very thermally hot. And in most sites around the UK and the world, uh, they're initially stored in ponds because water, again, is a very good shielding medium against neutrons. The water only, not only kind of uh, prevents neutrons uh, penetrating the, kind of the area around the pool, but also cools the rods, which makes them easier to handle for things like reprocessing. They can also be used, uh, stored in dry stores where there's forced convection used to cool the fueling rods. Uh, this is an example of a fuel rod uh, storage pond in the UK. This is the storage pond at Dungeness on the south coast at Kent. And you may just be able to see here the fuel rods submersed in the water. Uh, this is the storage pond of Thorpe, the thermal oxide reprocessing plant, which is at Sellafield. And here you can see the canisters again waiting to go through the reprocessing process. An example of how good water is for shielding um, neutrons can be seen from this reactor. This is a research reactor at a university. And here you can see the Cherenkov glow of the radiation coming off that reactor. And this pool type reactor here is open and it's quite safe to stand on this bridge here and observe the Cherenkov radiation and the reactor operating underneath the water because the water is such a good shield uh, for protection against neutrons. So why do we reprocess? Well, when the uranium is taken out of the reactor, there's only about 4% of the uranium that is actually burnt up and used. But significantly, the uranium-235 content has been reduced to less than 1%. So remember I said we increased it to about 4 or 5%. But when it's down to about 1%, the fuel rods are then removed. During the process of burn-up, plutonium is um, uh, created in that process. So when we take the fuel rods for reprocessing, we want to remove the uranium and the plutonium because they're a useful fuel source for uh, more fuel rods in use in future reactors. The uranium can be re-enriched and the plutonium can be blended with enriched uranium to produce MOX fuel. In the UK, we have um, this classification of waste. And this is how we kind of help to manage our waste by classifying it to decide which treatment route is used for the waste. So with low level waste, this is waste not exceeding four gigabecquerel per tonne alpha or 12 gigabecquerel per tonne beta gamma. And examples of low-level waste are discarded equipment, tools, and protective clothing. Uh, Intermediate-level waste is categorized as having radioactivity of levels higher than no-level waste, but not significantly heat-generating. So that means when we're trying to manage intermediate-level waste, we don't have to take the heat generation into consideration. And high-level waste has significantly heat-generating properties. So we have to take that into account when we're designing a way to immobilize high-level waste. An example of the high-level waste is the fission products separated during the reprocessing of fuel. Now, the challenges of radioactive waste are both radioactive and volume. So if you look at the kind of waste volumes from the 2007 waste inventory in the UK, we can see here that there are 3.2 million cubic metres of low-level waste, which roughly equates to a cube with sides of 147 metres. Intermediate waste, intermediate level waste, there's 240,000 cubic metres, which equates to a cube of about 62 metres on each side. And high level waste is 1,100 cubic metres, which would be contained if it was all put together in a cube with a side of 10 metres. So you can see there's considerably more volume of low level waste than intermediate or high level waste. But if we look at the activity in terabecquerels here, low level waste only has uh, 21 terabecquerels compared to 75 million for the high level waste. So 95% of the activity is in the high level waste volume and a very small percent of the activity is in the low level waste volume. So you can see here we have a volume problem as shown by the um, requirement to expand the capability at the low level waste repository near DRIG and we have a toxicity problem which has to be handled with the high level waste. If we look at total waste by volume, uh, this pie chart shows that the existing waste is 95% of what is expected to be generated in the UK from our current generating capacity. So that's all the Magnox fleet, all the AGR fleet, and the PWR near Sizewell. And only 5% of waste volume will be added before those uh, reactors are eventually decommissioned. So this volume does not include any potential waste from new build. And any new build waste will be much smaller in volume because the waste and the fuel will be better categorised 
and we'll know exactly how to deal with it compared to the legacy waste, which we have some issues about characterization with. So looking at a different pie chart now, this shows the uh, waste by activity. And you can see here, 57% of the, the total waste in the UK is from commercial reprocessing. Uh, the next biggest section of this pie chart is commercial reactors at about 30%. And then we have things like research and development, MOD, medical and indus industrial, and then a small percentage from fuel fabrication and uranium enrichment. So these processes both happen in the UK, but are very small contributors to the overall waste volume. So now we'll look at each individual type of waste by category and the ways that we can manage that waste. So firstly, low-level waste, or LLW. And this is an example of low-level waste. It's kind of discarded equipment, discarded clothing, and it's all put into a, a, a big drum like this. And that drum will be compacted to make it smaller and reduce the volume to its minimum. And you can see here, once those uh, drums have been um, crushed down, they are stacked all together in these isotope freight containers, and you get many of these canisters in one of these containers, and then these, can these containers are then stored at the low-level waste repository near Drig. And this is a photograph of Drig showing the uh, canisters here at the bottom in the containers, and you can see here that this uh, vault here is very uh, close to being full, and other vaults here have been landscaped over, and eventually this vault here, which is currently open, uh, will be landscaped over. A view here from uh, the south gives you a, a kind of uh, an idea of where the low-level waste repository near Drig is located, because in the uh, background here to the north, you can see the old cooling towers from the Calder Hall power station on the Sellafield site. So this low-level waste repository uh, is, very, is located very close to where a lot of the low-level waste is generated on the Sellafield site. Now, intermediate-level waste is starting to get... Um, more challenging to immobilize, and we have to use some kind of chemical processes to um, manage intermediate level waste in a safe and secure way. So one source of intermediate level waste is the cladding that's removed from these Magnox fuel rods. So these fuel rods are put through a decanning process, and you can see the fuel rod here, it's held in this um, device, and the uh, cladding is removed, and when it's removed, you end up with Magnox swarf, it looks like this, it's about the size of a finger. And this Magnox swarf is classified as intermediate level waste and therefore has to be immobilized. And the way we do it in the UK is to immobilize it through uh, putting it into barrels with cement. And you can see here the Magnox swarf is distributed through the cement. This is a non-radioactive version which has been cut open to show how the swarf is distributed through the cement. And you can see a different color cement here, a different kind of um, cement is used for the capping. And these uh, holes here are where pipes were put in to remove heat because cement is a, a kind of exothermic reaction and we want to remove as much heat as possible because we don't want that to lead to cracks which could lead to radioisotopes escaping. We can also use these barrels for compaction of solid waste here and the waste in the middle here is just compacted and placed in the centre of the drum. Once the intermediate level waste is immobilised in these drums, they can be transported and because they're transported, they are subject to a number of tests. And these tests um, car are carried out to make sure they are safe in the case of any accident that could occur during transportation. So this is a 25-metre drop here, and this is incineration to 1,000 degrees C. And these tests simulate the types of accidents that could possibly happen when this um, intermediate-level waste is being uh, transferred from site to site. So we're looking at things like a building collapse, a roof collapse, a train crash... Um, a seismic fault causing accidents or explosives near the um, intermediate level waste, or it could be uh, an electrical fire, a package fire, or something like that. So these kind of uh, testing is done um, to make sure that the containers are safe when it comes to uh, immobilizing the intermediate level waste. And we can see here the results. This is uh, the result after the incineration, and this uh, canister is intact here. And this is the canister after it's been dropped from the 25 metres. And there is some damage here to the lid, but this capping grout has stayed intact. And so the waste in the cement that's below the capping grout has remained intact and will not escape to the atmosphere. So now on to HLW. And with this, um, the chemical process gets um, more involved and more timely as well. And this diagram just shows you very briefly... Uh, the vitrification process of high-level waste in the UK. So once you've separated the uranium and the plutonium uh, from 
your um, uh, fuel rods, you're left with a highly active liquid uh, waste. And that is put in with some additives into a calciner. And this is um, used to heat um, the highly active liquid until it becomes a kind of granular solid. That granular solid is then mixed with some glass forming additives, typically borosilicate glass, although other kind of formulations can be used depending on the waste that goes through the calciner. And they are all melted together in this melter and put into a container. The lid is then welded on, the surface is decontaminated, and it's taken off uh, for storage after it's been through a swab machine to make sure there's no contamination on the outside. And all the high-level waste in the UK is currently stored at Sellafield in the high-level waste store. And you can see here how big these canisters typically are. And this is the uh, store at Sellafield with these remote handling devices that can place the canisters underneath these discs or remove them for inspection. And if you consider how much high-level waste is generated, I said it's quite a small volume. Well, this is typically the volume for one person's 80-year lifetime use of electricity. This is how much high-level waste will be generated for just one person. So it's a very small volume indeed. Uh, other examples of uh, the challenges that we've got with dealing with legacy waste are from the Dune Ray site in the north of Scotland. And this is where our fast breeder program uh, was uh, developed. And one of the things they um, did when they were developing the site was to uh, build this um, pipe out into the sea, to pipe some effluent out into the sea a practice which is no longer uh, legally allowed uh, anywhere in the world now. But to allow them to kind of build this tunnel, uh, they built a shaft down onto it. And you see here in cross-section, this is the shaft coming down, and this is the main tunnel. And then what happened is this, in the 1950s, this was kind of um, started to be constructed. for the discharge of low-level liquid effluent. <clears throat> and the shaft is about 4.6 metres in diameter and goes to a depth of 65 metres. Once the shaft had finished its use, a concrete plug was used to separate it from uh, the pipe and it was then allowed to fill up with groundwater. And in 1958, the Scottish Office authorised the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority to use the shaft as a disposal facility for radioactive waste. And until 1977, when the process was stopped, more than 11,000 disposals took place. Now, with, with tightening of environmental uh, legislation, the UK AEA are now required to remove all waste from the shaft or anybody who own, owns the Dune Ray site, because Babcock have recently bought out UK AEA. So this is a picture of the Dune Ray shaft in 1984, and there's a kind of uncharacterizable uh, waste slurry here containing miscellaneous wastes. So a plan had to be put in place how this waste was going to be retrieved from the Dune Ray shaft. And the plan they had was to surround the shaft, which is here, with a curtain of grout. So these blots, blue dots show where the grout will be injected around the shaft to form a curtain that will prevent water entering the shaft and prevent anything inside the shaft going out into the sea. And to enable them to drill these holes, a shaft platform was going to be constructed around the shaft. And here we see an artist's impression of what this platform would look like with all these holes for the curtain of grout around it. And this here is the actual platform which was constructed around the shaft. So this has gone very successfully up to this stage. And in 2008, the shaft was isolated ahead of program and ahead of budget or under budget. So the waste ret retrieval can now commence. But because the radioactive conditions in there Everything has to be done by remote control, and there are several complications. There's the quantity and the diversity of the, the waste. There's the depth that it'll be working at. There's a tremendous amount of corrosion after things have been down there for 50 years. And, of course, the base of the shaft is immersed in 60 metres of water. In March 2010, it was announced that the waste retrieval will be deferred until the completion of the site licence competition. So hopefully that will go through very soon, and this waste retrieval can go back on, chef, on schedule. And ultimately, with the shaft located here, this waste retrieval plant will be constructed to get the waste out of this shaft. So we've kind of got ways to manage our high level, intermediate and low level waste. So what next? Where can we put our waste for storage, which is termed retrievable, or for disposal, 
which is termed as non-retrieval. So what are the options we have? Well, there are several possible options. There are disposal in space. But this has been ruled out because we haven't got a very good track record when it comes to taking everything from the Earth's surface into space. So we don't want to kind of you know, dilute and disperse the radioactive waste if there's an explosion and something happens when we put it into space. Also, the idea of putting a large quantity of radioactive waste into orbit or beyond orbit, uh, perhaps we don't understand the full consequences of that. There's disposal in the ice sheets in the Antarctic, but this is not really a kind of possible option because it's illegal under international conventions. There's disposal in subduction zones, but we have no proof of concept that this would actually work. There is direct injection into the Earth, but this again has got no proof of concept and we don't know if we directly inject it, what would happen to the waste if it's not contained in any way whatsoever. We could dispose of it at sea, and this was done for many years until the early 80s, but again, this is illegal now under international convention. Or we could drill holes in the seabed and dispose of it there, but again, illegal under international convention. So some possible options which people put forward are not credible options for yeah, one of several reasons. And again, we could dilute and disperse, but again, we're not in the situation where we want to dilute and disperse. We'd rather concentrate and contain these days. So the probable options we have for what we do with our radioactive waste consist of indefinite storage, uh, near-surface disposal, such as the low-level waste repository near Drig, a phase-deep disposal, which I'll explain more about, or very deep borehole disposal. So these are possible options for how we could deal with our radioactive waste. So around the world, several countries are now in a situation where they're looking at uh, deep disposal in an engineered um, barrier system. So South Korea, France, Sweden have all selected sites, and France, Belgium, and Switzerland all have experimental sites. So they're all looking to kind of find ways of final disposal sites for their radioactive waste. So what's the UK doing? Well, we set up a committee called Quorum, which is the Committee for Radioactive Waste Management, and Quorum presented the recommendations to government in 2006. And later that year, in November 2006, Quorum accepted all the recommendations. Sorry, government accepted all the recommendations. So in summary, the Quorum recommendations are that geological disposal is the best form of long-term management. This has to be coupled with safe and secure interim storage. Because of the time frames involved, it may be 100 years from now before the final storage facility is closed. So we have to keep some radioactive waste in store for up to 100 years or more. So we have to make sure there is safe and secure interim storage for that period. The location of the geological disposal facility has to be selected through a volunteerism or partnership approach. This has to kind of help with securing facility siting to make sure the community is willing to have that site in its local facility. So the government expect, accepted all these uh, proposals and they are supportive of exploring the concept of volunteerism or partnership. And this process is currently ongoing with the um, Nuclear Decommissioning Authority being the implementing body at the moment for the disposal options in the UK. And the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority was established on the 1st of April 2005 with responsibility for all civil nuclear liabilities. And the main two aims of the NDA were to reduce the predicted cost of nuclear cleanup and to maintain the required skills base. Because it's going to take a long time of over 100 years to decommission all our sites, we have to make sure that we are training and educating the right people with the right skills to manage this process. And at the start, the NDA budget was about 70 billion, but this is kind of yeah, varying with different uh, government and technical uh, input. So we can look at the NDA sites here. These are all the uh, Magnox sites in the UK. They are not the AGR reactors, which are the responsibility of British Energy or now uh, EDF Energy. And there are other sites, such as uh, originally there was Springfield, but now this has been sold off back into Westinghouse. There's the, um, the low level waste depository near Drigg. And there are other sites, such as the research reactor sites, such as Harwell and Winfrith. And eventually, it's expected that the NDA may take. Uh, responsibility for the waste from the fusion site at the Cullum Science Centre. So looking at kind of one of the sites that the NDA is responsibility for, this is uh, the um, Hunterston A power station, uh, which is located on the west coast of Scotland. It's a two-unit facility, uh, 160 megawatts each, first grid connection in 1964, 
and shut down in 1990. And this is an area of 15 hectares, and the current site end plans are to remove all the waste, to delicense and landscape this, the site, and make it available for alternative use. And in the initial NDA uh, time frame for these plans, it was 2090 that final site clearance and closure was to occur. Uh, these dates may change because the NDA has kind of um, reviewed the situation. Um, perhaps some of the um, Magnox sites will be slower to decommission because it might be cheaper to take longer to do it. And also the situation at Sellafield and Dune Ray means that those are more urgent sites for managing the radioactive waste developed there. So as part of the management of the radioactive waste and the decommissioning at Hunterston, an intermediate level uh, waste store was constructed and you can see it's just been constructed here in the shadow of one of the reactors. And looking inside here, you can see there's a small gentleman here to show you the scale of the size of this uh, facility for intermediate level waste. So on to the most complex site in the UK, and perhaps one of the most complex sites in the whole world. This is the Sellafield site, which is on the coast in West Cumbria. And this is an old photograph here because you can see the cooling towers which are now being demolished for Calder Hall. In between the cooling towers are the four units here of Calder Hall reactor. Uh, you've got the wind scale piles located here, the wind scale advanced gas cooled reactor prototype. Uh, the central laboratory is located down here of the National Nuclear Lab. And you've got other facilities such as Thorpe, uh, etc. So Sellafield is a very complicated site indeed with many nuclear facilities. It's um, been operating since the 1940s. A uh, total area of 262 hectares, you can see it's much bigger than a typical uh, nuclear power plant site. And the site end state uh, will be hopefully to be decommissioned to a possibly safe state uh, with plutonium and uranium stored on site. But with the time frames involved, these plans could change. But at least there are plans in place to make sure that each of these uh, NDA sites have a plan of how they're going to be decommissioned. An example of how other countries are doing it is the ASPO Hard Rock Laboratory in Sweden. And this is a facility to look at all the technological challenges of disposing of radioactive waste uh, deep underground in a hard rock facility. So here, kind of consideration is taken as to how the waste will be transported underground, how it will be moved underground, how it will be stored, and how it will react with the local rock in that area. And ASPO and the, the, the Swedish plans in Forsmark are an example of what we call a multi-barrier concept. So in this case here, we can see that the waste is encapsulated in this drum. The drum is then put into another container with overpack, and these containers are then taken to the underground vault. Once the containers are placed there, then backfill is used to uh, put further barrier between the waste and the surface. And of course, you've got the depth of the repository as another barrier between the waste and the biosphere. So those are several barriers in between the radioactive isotope and the surface. So that's a multi-barrier concept. And in Sweden, they don't do any reprocessing. They just do spent fuel disposal. And here you can see an example of a spent fuel rod contained in a stainless steel matrix here, surrounded by the copper canister, which will be used for burial uh, of the waste in Sweden. Now, I mentioned a phase disposal concept. And this is a kind of a alternative to the, the basic deep disposal concept, where we have the kind of waste again put into these containers. But at this stage, before the backfill is put in place, there could be a period of 300 years, maybe 500 years, where this waste is monitored to make sure that it's in a currently secure and safe um, package and it's not leaked out or interfered or reacted with the rock in any way. And so this is where the term phase deep disposal comes from. So it could be a period here where we look at if the waste deteriorating. But some people argue that the phase approach is not necessary and if we put the waste into a suitably scientifically researched uh, container, then it'll kind of perform as predicted. And so we will save a lot of money by not monitoring it for 500 years. So a lot of these underground facilities have two types of access. We have an access drift here for the waste to be put in place. And you can see here where the vaults are. And you've got vertical lift for uh, men to go down or small bits of equipment, etc. And then you can see here the, the vaults where the intermediate level waste and high level waste are contained. Uh, some plans are for the intermediate level waste to be kept separately from the high level waste. Other plans are for them to be kept in the same facility. And with this vault concept, we have a possibility that these uh, containers are then put in place by an XY crane 
and we have ventilation to make sure that if there's any possibility of degradation due to the heat of high level waste, then that heat is removed from the system. Now one other alternative which I mentioned to a geological disposal facility with an engineered barrier solution is very deep borehole disposal. And very deep means we're talking depths of about five kilometres. So this is you know, about ten times deeper than the equivalent engineered barrier system which would be about 500 metres underground. And in this, instead of using an engineered barrier system, you're using more of a geology approach to isolate the waste from the surface. So in this case here, we're using technologies which are based on a lot of uh, drilling technologies from industries such as oil and gas. And this animation here shows you kind of how the borehole will be constructed and how the um, canisters will be put in place. So you can drill the first stage of the borehole and then you insert a casing and then you pour in a cement basement and then you go on like that down to about four kilometres. So you have a four kilometre deep hole which has got casing all the way down. Now the next stage after this casing has been uh, placed is to insert the canisters. Now we can insert a few of these canisters and once we've kind of you know, uh, modelled how many canisters we can go in, we can then pour in some grout around those canisters to give some more stability and then we can allow that grout to set. Now at that stage you can put in some bentonite clay for example before inserting another stack of canisters and we can repeat this until the bottom kilometre of the borehole is filled. So we're up to about four or three kilometres now and at that stage we can decide to seal uh, the radioactive waste there. And one way we can do this, there are various um, variants of this system, but one way is that we can put some backfill in which is crushed granite and then we can put a heater in to seal the borehole, pour in some more backfill and then seal the borehole again. So that waste is now completely isolated at a depth of about three to four kilometres underneath the surface. So that's a kind of alternative approach to putting it all in an engineered system at a depth of about 500 metres. And it's been considered by some countries around the world as a cheaper and perhaps more geologically sound solution to the burial of radioactive waste. Now, with the time frames involved with radioactive waste disposal, it's very hard to model what's going to happen in the laboratory. So we look at natural analogues, and these are kind of systems uh, around us in nature which we can use to gain information on, on how radioactive waste will um, react over the future you know, hundreds, thousands of years. And I mentioned bentonite clay a couple of times, and we're using that to isolate the waste in some way. Um, one natural analogue or one natural system that we use to kind of verify what we think is going to happen with clay is in Dunaroba in Italy. And here this photograph shows the uh, tree stumps that were found, preserved. There were 50 of these tree stumps that were found that were preserved. And these trees are grown about one and a half million years ago. And because they were isolated by this clay, uh, they had not become to rot at all. So this kind of shows us that clay can isolate items from oxygen and water, which would lead to the oxidation or the corrosion of any radioactive waste um, canisters or containers that were placed underneath the clay. I've talked about putting things about 500 metres underground in an engineered barrier system. Well, there's the Segal Lake uranium deposit, which lies about 430 metres below ground. And it's about 1 to 20 metres thick, a width of about 50 to 100 metres and a length of 2 kilometres. So perhaps even bigger than an engineered barrier system would need to be at a depth of 500 metres. But because this is surrounded by clay, or possibly one of the reasons that uh, it leads to this, is that because it is so deep and because there's clay, etc., there's no radiological trace at the surface of this um, deposit. So we can say that if we bury things at a depth of 500 metres, that we won't get any radiological trace on the surface. And then perhaps one of the most famous of uh, the natural analogues is the, the fossil reactor in Oklo in the Gabon. And here a uh, layer of uranium ore is sandwiched between sandstone and granite. And because many millions of years ago there was a higher percentage of uranium-235 in naturally occurring ore, uh, this created the possibility of a natural fission reactor. But crucially in this situation there was water trickling through the uranium ore which caused the neutrons to be moderated and so chain reaction was possible with the neutrons emitted through the fission being moderated and then the water would boil away and the chain reaction would stop. And this reactor worked on and off for more than a million years. Now the high level waste created 
by these rocks, including plutonium, has only travelled about three metres in two billion years. So this is a very long time scale experiment which we can show that uh, rock can be used to immobilise plutonium and prevent it kind of moving about. It's not going to kind of move by osmosis or any kind of chemical process to allow it to transport away from the site. So that's a quick run through, through some of the systems we use for immobilisation and disposal of radioactive waste. Um, some websites you may wish to look at. This um, presentation will be made available on nltv.co.uk. There's lots of information on uh, education and if you want to do courses in radioactive waste or any aspect of nuclear science or technology at nuclearliaison.com. There's a wealth of uh, uh, material on radioactive waste immobilisation at the Radioactive Waste Immobilisation Network website. More information on the Committee of Radioactive Waste Management, NDA and Sellafield is available on these websites. And if you're interested in becoming more active in you know, kind of uh, talking about nuclear waste or talking about the nuclear industry in general, uh, have a look at this website. This is the website of the Young Generation Network of the Nuclear Institute. Thank you.